Once we establish the structure of an object-oriented design, the next thing is to establish how we achieve all of the use cases, all the events, all the things that come up from there. You gotta remember, in objects, everything happens through objects. We don't just have magic procedures, magic processes like we do in structured design. We have to have some object involved. So we have to define behavior of objects. And objects collaborate to get stuff done, so we have to understand which pieces of behavior lives in which objects and which ones are going to talk to which ones to get stuff done. And in order to be able to solve that problem, we have a specific set of diagrams that helps us talk about which objects are created and then which ones are collaborating to get the work done for whatever you know, the task is at hand. Now, since work is done in objects, we have to remember it's not classes. If we create a procedure, we create a function inside of a structured programming language, that is the thing that operates, that is the thing that does the work. So think of it this way. You do not drive a car. Like, so for me, I have a Kia Sorento. I don't drive as Kia Sorento. I drive a specific model that came off the factory on a specific date, has a specific VIN number, has its own brakes and engine and everything else like that than somebody else who has the same car that's out there. So you could have the same model year, you could have the same color, you could have everything else. Yours is a different car. So even our cars have the same specification, the same everything else, they do something slightly different. It's also true in software. You and I could have the same application. You're watching YouTube right now. You could be watching YouTube in Chrome. I could have Chrome as well, but each of us have a customized version of that. You have your own settings, you're logged in as you, not logged in as me. When I go to YouTube on Chrome, I have different settings than you do. I can do different things than you do because I have a different instance of that YouTube application that's up in the browser. And so we have to understand that inside the world. So when we're looking at this stuff, we're not even looking at class, we're looking at specific objects. So the first type of diagram we'll talk about is called the sequence diagram. And inside of a sequence diagram, there's things that will look like classes up top, but they are instances of an object. And so there's two different things we can look at. So if you look at manage item GUI, that's a class name inside of there. How do I know it's a class name? It's a capital letter M. Item controller, same thing. Item DAO, the same thing. What that implies is in my system, there is one and only one of these things out there. So I don't need to name it because there's just one of them. As opposed to new item inside of there, which is a unique object. It's the new one that just got created. There's other items, there's old items, there's yesterday's item, there's the one I just sold, there's the one I'm about to sell, there's the one I got the price for. There's all sorts of named items that are out there, but this is the item I'm dealing with, the specific named one. And so that's what we see across the top in those boxes is objects. And those are the objects that are interacting to do the work. So think of it this way. Uh, in the classroom, you have a teacher, you have a student, no, you don't. You have a classroom role of a teacher. You have a, a bunch of people who fill the role of students, but we have specific individuals here. Tony, that's me. I'm a teacher. You, your name, you're the student. That's what we're seeing across the top. Now, the interactions between these are common. They're common across all objects. We just need to know which one is participating in that behavior at the same time. So here we see the manage item GUI. We create a new item. Then we set some values in that new item, Here's some shorthand, so I could be saying set name, set price, set description, set whatever I want to set inside of there. And then I add that using the item controller. We could also have an object call itself. So inside the item controller, there's a validate method it calls on itself, and then it adds it using the item DAO. So that's the different stages that are happening here. So the dotted lines that fall down from there, that's called the, the tail. This, it's the lifeline of each of these objects. Those are the things that receive and send messages between the objects. And then the name of the methods are in between there. So that's all the pieces we can see that make up the sequence diagram. And we'll get into that more as we go. But this is specifically an interaction of objects. If I'm the instructor and I'm grading a student, let's say my student's name is uh, Mary. So Tony grades Mary's papers. Mary is the student currently being graded. That's the interaction that we would see inside of there. So I would do the same interaction between Tony and Ben. I'd do the same interaction between Tony and uh, Sanjay, you know, whoever I would be working with inside of there. So that's the prototype here. It doesn't change the objects. It doesn't change the classes. It just shows the type of interaction for the people that show up there. 
And so let's come back to each of these pieces. That lifeline is an important piece. You can call it a tail there as well. This is the behavior that we're seeing. The lifeline implies time, starting at the top and going down from there. Um, it's not necessarily always perfectly accurate, but typically, unless it gets really big, starts at the top and goes down. Um, the behavior is attached to the tail. So at, at, if it starts an arrow, then it's making the call. If it ends an arrow, then it's receiving a call. And that basically the, the name on the lines that go between it is the name of the methods being called. So the assumption is if you have an arrow that points to you, you must have that method available as part of your class definition, something you can service as part of the object. And so those messages then become what def is defined by the methods. If you're using a very fancy UML tool, you can actually pull up instantly from the methods that are already exist in the class, or if you add a message that's not existing in the class, it will add that method inside of there. The standard method is shown using a solid line and arrow towards it, or you can see a solid line and arrow within. If you see, in this case, the dotted line going back, that implies a return value, and that is optional. If you don't have a return value, you don't need to put it there. Or you can just say there's no value returned. This is just the point at which it returns. Um, it is assumed that it does return. If it's not there, it will return, and any values returned will be returned at that point. But it doesn't have to be shown. It just makes it more clear when that sequence is done, when that call is finished. Often you can tell just by looking at the diagram, oh, this must be where the methods call ends, but you can show it explicitly, particularly if it helps improve the understanding, improve the clarity of the diagram. So that's the sequence diagram in a nutshell. This is the most typical diagram you're going to see, and that's why we're talking about it first. It's very easy to follow the structure. It very clearly shows the time sequence. It very clearly can show you multiple interactions between objects. But it's not the only mechanism for being able to show behavior between the two different objects. So there's also something called the collaboration diagram. It's much the same in purpose and intent. Um, it really shows the exact same type of interaction, but it allows you to arrange objects more flexibly. And it really allows you to show the depth of interconnections between objects much more clearly. Um, we'll see um, some benefits of each of these at the end here, but this is a different, it's an alternative approach to it that essentially is doing the same thing. So this is a basic collaboration diagram. It shows objects, once again, you can name the objects, you can not name the objects, it's up to you. Um, and it shows lines of which objects talk to which other objects. So in this case, you can see the manage item talks to the new item, it talks to the item controller, and the item controller talks to the item DAO. Possibly the other way around too, it doesn't necessarily show direction at this point, we'll see that coming up in a second. It doesn't necessarily mean that an object isn't passed as a parameter. So it is possible in both of these that I could take like new item and pass it into item controller, which passes into item DAO as a parameter. This is just showing direct method calls that are happening between that. When you would write the code, you would say manage item GUI would be calling the code new item dot set value or item controller dot add. And item controller is called item DAO dot add. So that's the implication that's going on inside of that. It's, it's, it's a direct call dependency. Now, each box here, as we said, is an object, the same as sequence diagram. I can have one object or many objects that's implied by these boxes. There could be many that are involved. So if I have a list of objects, the interaction could be much the same. And the line is just a path of communication. It's not a specific method call at this point. We will see specific method calls, but that's not what we're seeing here. The goal, as we said, is to give you a structure to it. And you can kind of cluster these objects to show which objects interact more or less with each other. If there's some sort of circular dependency or something that's very complicated the way these objects interact, it allows you to look at that because if you see circles inside of this, and that's one great use of the sequence diagram, of the collaboration diagram, excuse me, above the sequence diagram, if you see circles in there, it is implying your, your design is probably not appropriate. You don't want A to call B to call C to call A because that's just a it's too interdependent inside of there. You want some separation of those dependencies to be able to allow for um, reusability, allow for 
you know, uh, so independence inside of there. And we don't have time to talk about it here, but there's ways to separate those things, like creating intermediary objects that kind of play the role in between. Um, there's different things that come up along those lines. Um, but let's get to the next of this. The next thing is showing the interactions. Now, the interactions here, as you can see, have been added by little arrows. And those arrows are numbered. The numbering shows the time sequence. You have the first call 1.1, second call 1.2, third call 1.3, fourth call 1.4. This is one way to show it. You can also show it hierarchically. You could say call 1, 2, 3, and then 1.3.1. So instead of saying 1.4 add, you could say 1.3.1, which implies that it's the third call that happens off of that. There's different ways you can do that, which shows nesting of calls if you want to. Um, but the point here is I'm the order of the calls is shown numerically, and it's not necessarily shown top down inside of there. I have to kind of put it together in my head. So the sequence diagram gives us a direct view visually. The collaboration diagram shows clustering and grouping and shows the calls using this numbering sequence. But they, hopefully you can see, deal with the same type of information. So the each extra arrow shows an extra calls, and the numbering can be used to show sub calls inside of there like we talked about. So that's the interactions that we're going to define. So which one should you use? Well, as we said, the sequence diagram is really great to show the ordering very visually, top to bottom. It's very structured and very easy to arrange. All you have to really do is move objects left to right. There's tool support to help you with that. And it does show asynchronous calls. So that's basically where you, know, you make a call and don't get a response back. It's sending an email versus making a phone call. Collaboration diagrams allow you as the designer to show the structure you want to show. And it lets you sh look at those interdependencies much more closely. And it takes up a lot less space. If I have 10 objects on a, on a sequence diagram, I have to have 10 wide classes inside of there. Where collaboration, I can use my X, Y space and be able to have it be more compressed. Um, honestly, sequence diagrams are much more common. I've found collaboration diagrams work very well when you're dealing with batch jobs. Sequence diagrams, the top to bottom ordering is great in response to events like a web page click or a GUI click or a web service call. But in batch jobs, you tend to have a lot of stuff going on and they go on for a long time. There's a lot of objects involved and allows you to order the objects much more uh, cohesively and show the interdependencies within that. Now, to ask one bit of curiosity, well, why the heck are there two of these? Again, they do mostly the same thing. The biggest the reason I can tell you is when the unified modeling language was created, there was three or four people who were creating things. So one was, there's three basically, Jim Rumbaugh, Grady Booch, and um, I Ivar Jakobsen were the three big thought leaders of the time who had different notations. And they got together and merged most everything, but they each kind of liked both of these, so they kept them both. I don't know if Somebody didn't win the fight, or they just all agreed that each had their own different purposes. But there's not one better than the other, per se. One is more common than the other, but as I said, I think they both have their purposes. So you are, if you're taking the UML path, going to be asked to create one or the other of these. You can choose which. Again, sequence diagram is most common. Either one of them can be drawn very easily, whether you're using... Visio or some UML tool or just simply using the Microsoft Office Suite. You use PowerPoint to draw these. Uh, everything in this slide presentation was PowerPoint. Um, so you can choose them and you can draw them. So good luck and let's see what you can come up with.